So Bellator 293 is going to be coming up this weekend and we've got no UFC but we do have Bellator and we do have PFL and I'm going to be talking about that in this video. So welcome back to We Want Picks. I am Artem MMA and I'm going to be giving you guys my predictions for all 17 fights on this Bellator card. It's not the most stacked Bellator card in the world but it should be a pretty good one. There's a lot of showcase spots for a lot of undefeated prospects on this card all the way through. There's so many undefeated fighters on the card and I will be talking about them in this video video but before we get into that obviously we do have the we want picks premium membership service and if you want to maybe get into it and have a little trial you can get a free three-day trial by using my code artem in the we want picks premium section on the website that's we want picks.com slash premium and it is on my brand new overlay i actually made this after i recorded the pfl video i went and made a new overlay so hopefully you guys like the overlay as well I think it's pretty cool. It didn't take me too long to make. Uh, it did test my Photoshop skills just a little bit, but uh, let's not waste too much more time. Let's get straight into the predictions. So the first fight of the night, or at least the first fight on Tapology's card, is going to be Maria Henderson taking on Mackenzie Stiller. And I'm expecting this to be a very competitive fight. Maria Henderson and Mackenzie Stiller are both purple belts in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. And Mackenzie Stiller also actually has a black belt in Judo. So they're both probably going to want to take the fight to the ground. But with Maria Henderson, we have actually seen quite a bit of striking come out of her um, amateur and professional, professional career so far. I am picking Maria Henderson to win this fight by decision. I'm not entirely confident in her to win though because I do think Mackenzie Stiller does have great grappling herself. But I'm going with Maria Henderson. I feel like she's going to be a lot more committed to the game. You know, Benson Henderson has retired kind of mainly to focus on Maria Henderson's own MMA career. So that's going to be very interesting to see how she can... Um, how she can adapt to that, but I do think that Maria Henderson wins. She's a slight favorite. She's minus 185. You guys can't see because of my new overlay. I'm sorry, but Maria Henderson's minus 185. Mackenzie Stiller is plus 155, and I do have her to win this matchup is Maria Henderson by decision, and most people do as well on Tapology. We'll move on to the next bout. Bryce Meredith taking on Brandon Carrillo. I'm picking Bryce Meredith. I'm picking Bryce Meredith by finish. I think Bryce Meredith's awesome. I think he's actually a great MMA prospect, and it's quite cool to see that Bellator has picked him up, and they're giving him a fight, which he should win. You know, he is a minus 1,500 favorite in this matchup. But an interesting little fact about Bryce Meredith, if you don't know, he has actually got a very good wrestling background, and he went 61-13 and 13 in college wrestling. He was an NCAA Division I wrestler, and he got a NWCA All-Academic Team, and I believe he's the only 18th person in his school to get the award. And also, he had a great high school wrestling record of 123 and 8. I do apologize, guys. I'm from New Zealand, so I don't necessarily understand what these awards do mean. But I do understand, and you see it in his MMA fights, that Bryce Meredith does have an incredible wrestling background. And Brandon Carrillo... He hasn't fought in a while. I think it's been about a year or so since he fought Eugene Murray. And even then, we don't have much to go off of because he won the fight in less than two minutes by KO. And Eugene Murray was 0-2. So I'm going with Bryce Meredith. I expect him to kind of look for the takedowns. I expect him to use that wrestling background and probably lock up some sort of ground and pound TKO or submission. I think Bryce Meredith gets it done inside the distance as a minus 1,500 favorite. We move on to Randy Field versus Ashley Cummins. Um, I'm going with Randy Field. I watched a lot of Ashley Cummins' tape because she's been in a lot of 25-minute fights with Invicta, and I watched them all. Um, I am picking Randy Field in this one here. Ashley Cummins, she seems to be mostly a striker, but if she wants to, she can grapple against the fence, and what I mean by that is just clinch up against the fence to stall time and maybe gain control time off that. But um, for the most part, she's actually defending a lot of takedowns against her opponents. But a key in this matchup is that most of her opponents are at 105 pounds. She has fought at strawweight before, but most of her most recent fights in Invicta FC were at atomweight, 105 pounds against opponents that were about her size, and in um, some cases, even smaller than her. To be fair, Randy Field is only listed at 5'3 herself. But she's fought at 125 before. She's fought at 115 pounds before as well. This is a catch weight at 120 pounds. And Ashley Cummins hasn't fought for two and a half years. She is the favorite in the matchup, and I totally understand why. But I've got Randy Field here. She's been more active. 
She didn't have the most um, successful amateur career. I think she went 2-4 and four as an amateur as Randy Field. And then she had a very close fight with this girl who's 3-5. and five, And is now 3-7. and seven, Which is a huge red flag. But um, I've got Randy Field here. Stylistically, I think she should be able to win the matchup. She's going to be going for takedowns and actually trying to take the fight to the ground. Whereas Ashley Cummins um, should be the better striker in the matchup for sure. But I've got Randy Field by getting takedowns and winning by decision. I think she's actually an overwhelming favorite on Tapology, which is very interesting. But I think a lot of people might just be looking at the 7-6 and six and 3-1 and one record. But Ashley Cummins has fought very good opponents. I mean, she fought uh, and beat Jessica Dalboni by decision, who was 7-0 at the time in Invicta. But it was four years ago. And then she fought Jin Yu Frey, who's in the UFC, but that was three years ago. And then she fought Alicia Zapatella and got submitted in that fight. And a fight that she was actually up on the judges' scorecards because in Evicta, you can actually see the scorecards live, or at least at that time you could anyway. And um, she got subbed by Von Fluschok. She went for her own guillotine choke, and Alicia Zapatella turned it into like a Von Flu. Some people called it a shoulder choke and ended up subbing uh, Cummins that way. But I do have Randy Field in the matchup. She is the underdog, actually. Ashley Cummins is minus 154. Randy Field is plus 124 right now on Bet Online. I do have Randy Field. I don't feel that good about it. Um, but yeah, I do think she's going to win just with the size advantage. And also her style is to take down Ashley Cummins. And as the bigger fighter, she should be able to do that. I'm going to speed through the next few prelims because I realized I spent a little bit too much time talking about the first three fights. So Mike Hamill taking on Nick Brown. I do have Nick Brown. I was very impressed by him on the tape. He shoots for takedowns and um, even against Islam Ahmed, he's shooting for takedowns. He's pretty dangerous on the feet. He gets KOs. But what's so impressive about Nick Brown is he's always rolling for submissions no matter what. He had his back kind of taken by Bobby Lee when he was taken down. And then he rolled into that heel hook. It was amazing. It was very impressive. He was rolling for submissions against Islam Amadov. He was like turning like uh, triangles into back takes in the first round against Mamadov at the end of the first. It was pretty impressive again. But I like that from Nick Brown because Mike Hamill probably is going to look to take him down, which will be interesting. Potentially a mistake because Nick Brown is pretty dangerous. Um, as a grappler, you know, he submitted Trey Ogden in the first round, who's a black belt and is in the UFC himself. Mike Hamill, he's decent, he's a decent striker, he's a decent wrestler, but he's not the biggest finisher. You know, he's got six wins by decision, three wins by KO. He has been submitted once before in his career, it was a very long time ago, but I do think Nick Brown is able to get the submission again, and um, he is a very slight underdog, actually. Nick Brown is plus 112 to Mike Hamill being minus 140, and Mike Hamill... Is, sorry, Nick Brown is the massive favorite on uh, Tapology, which is interesting because the odds don't suggest that whatsoever. But I do like Nick Brown by submission in this matchup. We move on to Christian Edwards taking on Rakeem Cleveland. I've got Christian Edwards. I'm not as confident as the odds do suggest. Christian Edwards is a minus 450 favorite. Rakeem Cleveland is plus 350. And Christian Edwards is moving up a weight class after a two-fight losing streak. But he should find success at heavyweight because he is... Um, Six foot five. He's a pretty big guy. He's got a very long reach as well as 78 and a half inches. He hasn't um, found the most success in his last two fights. You know, he lost to Ben Parrish as a huge favorite. Ben Parrish was not meant to win that fight at all. And then he lost to Grant Neal. But Grant Neal is a very good fighter who just beat Carl Albrechtson. And I'm very high on Carl Albrechtson. Maybe a little bit too high. But um, yeah, Christian Edwards, you know, he's only lost to, to um, some of the better fighters in, in Bellator or better prospects, I guess you could say, aside from maybe Ben Parrish. But he beat Simon Biong, Rakeem Cleveland. He's lost to some really good guys like Tyrell Fortune and Steve Murray in Bellator. But man, he hasn't looked good at all in those matchups. He's been finished in the first round twice now. And in those fights, he just hasn't impressed, you know. And even then, his, his wins as of recent as well just aren't, once again, the most impressive wins because he's beating 9 and 6, 7 and 10, and 15 and 9 opponents. He does have a very good win in 2018, but we're digging five years ago now, and it's by injury. So it's interesting, you know. He is only losing to great, great fighters like Maxim Grishin, Viktor Nemkov, and Steve Murray and Tyrell Fortune, but. He hasn't looked good in his most recent matchups at all. So I've got Christian Edwards by finish. Um, Rakeem Cleveland's been submitted eight times in his career. I wouldn't be too surprised if Christian Edwards can maybe hurt him on the feet just by being so much faster and then find a submission after that. But I've got Christian Edwards. Minus 450 is a little bit scary, but he should be able to get it done. And then we move up to Pam Sorensen versus Sarah Collins. I do have Pam Sorensen 
In the matchup, she is a very slight favorite. She's minus 150 to Sarah Collins being plus 120. Sarah Collins, I did watch her fight and I wasn't very impressed like at all. She is winning uh, by using her wrestling and grappling, but well more so judo I guess you could say, but she's not looking good, she's not fighting the best opponents, I know they're debuting fighters and she's very early on in her own career, but Jamie Abendon really had no grappling whatsoever, she had absolutely no idea what to do after Sarah Collins took her down. And um, Sarah Collins gassed out badly in the third round in that fight as well. I think that Sam Sorensen, Pam Sorensen is going to be able to win the fight. And if she doesn't win the fight, she's going to win the third round. So all she's got to do is win the first or the second. And I think she should be able to do that over Sarah Collins. Sarah Collins striking is not too impressive either. I think Pam Sorensen, um, she should be able to get it done here. She's fought decent competition herself in Bellator and in Victor FC. She's got a couple of good wins as well. I guess her best wins probably do come over Jessica Rose Clark, but that was a long time ago. But um, she did beat Caitlin Young, who ended up in PFL. She's lost to Felisa Spencer, went four rounds with her. So I um, guess it's not too bad. She beat Alina Kaliznik, who's in the PFL now. Shanna Young was in the UFC for a bit. Nico Montano was a UFC champion at one point. <laughs> like, you know what I mean. Like, I don't know. I, I just got Pam Sorensen um, to beat Collins. I just didn't like Corins, Collins on the tape when I was watching her fight. So give me Pam Sorensen by decision. The next fight is Lance Gibson Jr. taking on Vladimir Tokov, and uh, I'm picking Lance Gibson Jr., but I am really tempted to pick Vladimir Tokov. I did watch his tape, and I was impressed, and this fight, honestly, is probably going to come down to who can get the takedown first and who can be on top. Lance Gibson Jr., in my opinion, will probably be the more powerful and more dangerous striker, but Vladimir Tokov's striking isn't too bad either. He spent pretty much the whole fight against JJ Wilson on top of JJ Wilson, but JJ Wilson did get the split decision win just by throwing up so many submissions and winning the fight off his back pretty much, but you could easily um, score that fight for Tokov, but JJ Wilson was probably just being the more active fighter trying to finish the fight, even though he spent absolutely no time pretty much on, on, on top. It was uh, all Tokov being on top, but JJ Wilson would take the back at times. He would put him in some really nasty uh, submission attempts, so yeah, he got the decision that way, but Lance Gibson Jr. Um, is a dangerous guy. He's dangerous on the feet. He gets takedowns himself. I watched this fight against Nino Dung, and Nino Dung was completely exhausted after the, the pace that um, Lance Gibson Jr. actually put on him by taking him down, beating him up on the feet. Uh, Lance Gibson Jr. as well, NCAA Division NCAA Division I wrestler for Arizona State University, so he's obviously got a good wrestling background himself. And I think, um, as I said, whoever gets on top and whoever um, is able to get the first takedown will probably win this fight. And Vladimir Tokov was shooting takedowns against JJ Wilson in the first 30 seconds of every single round. So, um, yeah, I don't know. It'll be interesting to see. But I think Lance Gibson Jr. is going to have much better takedown defense and just be stronger than JJ Wilson, especially because JJ Wilson was a featherweight moving upper weight class as well in that fight. We're going to be going to uh to the lions and lance gibson jr is actually the underdog at plus 165 tokov is their favorite but i i do pick lance gibson jr i think he's going to get it done over vladimir tokov um tokov when he does get on top he doesn't really do, seem to do too much wasn't able to really do anything to jj wilson lance gibson jr has got vicious ground and pound it's brutal he's finished opponents with ground and pound he's finished opponents with submissions as well I think this is a big step up in competition for Gibson Jr., but I do think he passes and does beat Tokov by a decision in this matchup here. The next one is Lucas Brennan taking on Josh Sandiogo, and I'm going to be honest, it's a little bit embarrassing to say, but I didn't actually realize until somewhat recently, Lucas Brennan is actually Chris Brennan's son. So Chris Brennan fought at UFC 16, I believe, in the tournament there, and he fought at UFC 35, I think, and he's also fought at um, Pride as well. So Chris Brennan, a lot of submissions on his record, like something like 20 or 30 subs on his record, very experienced MMA fighter, and Lucas Brennan is his son. I did not know that. Um, I'm a little bit embarrassed to admit it, but... I'm an honest dude, <laughs> and um, I'm picking him to win this fight here against Josh San Diego. Lucas Brennan's had a couple of fights fall through recently. He's a very talented grappler. Most of his wins are by submission. He's got a great Brazilian jiu-jitsu background as well. And he's a young guy. He actually fought in MMA when he was 17 years old when he fought in LFA, I believe it was. But very impressive. Um, he's had a couple of cancelled fights. I believe the Dre Miley fight was actually cancelled because Dre Miley wasn't allowed to fight in the state that the event was in. Because Dre Miley has one eye. Um, pretty cool. Um, 
Thanks, I guess, but good for Dre Miley. Um, but yeah, Josh Sandiego hasn't fought for four years. He's fought five times in the last six and a half years. I'm not entirely sure why he, he's been out for so long as well, because he actually hasn't had any fights booked throughout that period of time. So I don't know if he's been pulling out of fights due to injury, or maybe he retired and he's coming back for this fight. But I've got Lucas Brennan by submission. I'm pretty confident in it as well. Lucas Brennan's like minus 900. Josh Sandiego something like plus 600 himself. I really do think that Lucas Brennan should be able to get the job done by submission in this matchup here. He submitted decent guys. Not the best guys in the world. This is the most experienced opponent he's had to fight. But San Diego hasn't fought um, in four years. So it's a bit of a red flag. We move on. Speaking of fighters not fighting for a long period of time. Uh, Joey Davis hasn't fought for over two years. But researching Joey Davis and looking into him I was very impressed by kind of everything I found out so he actually trains with AJ McKee and AJ McKee's father and he's got a very impressive wrestling background I believe he was uh, the four-time NCAA Division II National Wrestling Champion for Notre Dame College and had a wrestling record of 133-0 and unfortunately you guys can't see it because of my overlay I apologize but 133 and 0 college wrestling record, and he's the first and only Division II wrestler to end a four-year wrestling career undefeated, which is um, amazing. It's incredible wrestling background that he's got, Joey Davis. That is, and Jeff Creighton um, is a good grappler. Most of his wins are by submission. He's got five of them. He did get finished by Max Rochkoff and Max Rochkoff first fight since um, leaving the UFC off that one loss. Um, when he put on the skill stall sort of thing, but I think Max Rochkoff is now in um, Bellator himself now. But yeah, I've got Joey Davis here. He hasn't fought for two years though, but he's a huge favorite minus twelve hundred. His striking's quite impressive as well, and he has beaten better opponents than Jeff Creighton. He beat the twelve and four Bobby Lee at the time, and he's beaten very experienced opponents himself. He's been getting the KOs. He's been using his wrestling as well. All he's really got to avoid with Jeff Creighton is probably just Jeff Creighton's submission ability, but. As I said before, Joy Davis is minus 1,200 in this fight. I'm a little bit nervous about that because he hasn't fought for two years. So maybe if he got a takedown on Jeff Crater and Jeff Crater threw up a bunch of submissions, maybe he could get something as a huge dog. But I do think Joey Davis is going to come back in a big way. He's been in better opponents than Jeff Creighton. I think he should be able to finish Jeff Creighton. I'm going to go with a KO, actually. I think he's going to get a KO. I mean, Max Rochkoff was able to finish him by TKO. So give me Joey Davis uh, by KO in this matchup here. Beck versus Prospect. You've got Archie Colgan taking on Justin Montalvo. And this is going to be both guys' toughest uh, opponent of their whole career because Archie Colgan, throughout his career, hasn't really fought the greatest level of competition. And you could say the same sort of thing for Justin Montalvo. You know, his last win for Archie Colgan was 2-1, and 8-4, and 4-1. And and but Justin Montalvo himself hasn't really fought the best guys. Both guys uh, are great Bellator prospects, 5-0 and and 6-0, and obviously. But I do have... Archie Colgan in this one here. Archie Colgan's got a wrestling background. And um, he went 68 and 32 as a college wrestler. Was one win away from being an All-American wrestler himself. And Justin Montalvo's got a pretty good boxing base. I think he's actually a very good boxer. He likes to rip the body as well, which could potentially could uh, wear down on Archie Colgan. And he is going to be the bigger guy in the matchup. He's six foot with a 73 and a half inch reach. Whereas Archie Colgan is 5'9 with a 69 and a half inch reach. But Archie Colgan being the wrestler, being shorter, probably um, isn't going to hinder him too much. And I do think he is going to look to use the wrestling in this game plan. So I've got Archie Colgan to win the fight by using his wrestling background. And I think he does beat Justin Montalvo in this matchup here. We move up the card. I'm picking a lot of Bellator underdogs. <laughs> It scares me a lot. I'm going to be honest. I'm going with Adam Piccolotti to beat Mandel Nalo. And the reason why me picking a lot of Bellator underdogs uh, scares me so much is because a lot of uh, time, a lot of big favorites in Bellator tend to win. But I've got another underdog in this one here. I'm just trying to find the best fight odds. There you go. Adam Piccolotti plus 125 to Mandel Nalo, who's minus 155. Mandel Nalo is must-watch TV. He's very, very exciting, and I have a feeling this might be um, somewhat short notice as well because Adam Piccolotti is stepping in for JJ Wilson, who's from the UF, uh, sorry, not from USC, from New Zealand, where I'm from. But um, And he's got a, a beautiful mullet, does JJ Wilson. That's why my hair is so long right now. I'm going out a really awesome mullet for, uh, 
for an event that's going to be halfway through the year, but uh, <laughs> enough about me. Um, I've got Adam Piccolotti. I think he's going to be able to survive the storm that is Mando Nello. Uh, Mando Nello is all finishes, all gas, no breaks. Every one of his is in the first or the second round. Um, every time he's lost, has been TKO in the second or third round. And, um, man, I think that we're going to see Adam Piccolotti survive the storm that is Mandonello, and I think he's going to be able to get it done by decision, actually. Mandonello's never been the distance before. I think Matt, um, Adam Piccolotti's going to take him uh, all three rounds. So it should be interesting. Adam Piccolotti's won a lot of decisions in his career. He does have great grappling, but I think he's going to be able to weather the storm that is Mandonello. Um, take some of his shots and also look to take down himself, grind out the fight and win the fight as an underdog by decision and Mandonello has never been the distance. So should be interesting but I do think they should be able to get it done by decision. So does most of Tapology as well. Tapology needs to stop copying my picks. I'm just kidding. It's interesting though. All these dogs that I'm picking are also Tapology favorites and I'm not even looking at the Tapology votes before I make this video. But we move on to Sullivan Corley taking on Luke Trainer. I'm picking Sullivan Corley. I'm not that confident though, especially because I've seen a lot of people put bets on Luke Trainer because Sullivan Corley, I don't know if you guys can see, unfortunately, you can't, and I can't move it on best fight odds, but Sullivan Corley opened minus 600. He's minus 260 right now. Luke Trainer is plus 200. I believe Luke Trainer probably opened up around like plus 400 or thereabouts if um, uh, Sullivan Corley was minus 600, but. That's some crazy odds to open on, and um, I do understand why so many people jumped on it. Luke Trainer is huge for this division. Sullivan Corley might be six foot three, but Luke Trainer is six foot six, and he's very, very good. He's got all finishes on his career, and so does Sullivan Corley. Actually, all of Sullivan Corley's wins are also by finish, and I believe they're all by knockout. Um, the tapology part isn't loading, which is a bit of a shame. But yeah, all five of his wins are by knockout in the first round, and uh, that makes me nervous. Because if I'm picking Sullivan Corley, I'm kind of picking him to catch Luke Trainer, And I do think that he is going to be able to catch Luke Trainer. Luke Trainer is very good at getting on the back. All three of his submission wins are by rear naked choke. He subbed the 11 and 3 Lucas Alcina by that way. Um, we also have seen him sub uh, a bunch of other opponents, obviously by rear naked choke. All three wins by rear naked choke. He's very good at finding the back. He does um, like to find the back. I've said that four times in the last 30 seconds, so I'm going to... Probably just move on, but <laughs> I feel like if Luke Trainer isn't able to get Sullivan Cooley to the mat or try and control him or try and find a submission, I think he's going to be in a bit of trouble on the feet. Sullivan Cooley, he hits hard, but the thing about Luke Trainer is he's tall for this division. He's got a very big reach advantage as well. 81 inch reach to Sullivan Cooley's 74 and a half inch reach, so it's an interesting one. This is another prospect versus prospect fight, but I'm going with Cooley. I'm not that confident. Um, I am. I'm. I'm confident enough, but at minus six hundred, I would have been like, "Oh, that's really scary." But minus two sixty is still pretty wide as well for this fight. I think Trainer could be live, but I do like Corley. I'm picking him by KO, uh, first or second round. I think we might actually see this fight leave the first round and uh, Corley maybe get a finish after that. So give me Sullivan Corley by KO at some point in the fight, probably first or second round. This next fight is going to be a very interesting one, and I'm going to be gambling a lot with my pick for this fight. It is Jaleel Willis taking on Rustam Kabalov, and my pick, which isn't a confident one, is Rustam Kabalov. I'm picking Rustam Kabalov to win this one. Here is a slight underdog. He is plus 140 in the matchup to Jaleel Willis, being minus 170. It's an interesting one, because Rustam Kabalov spent a very, very big proportion of his career at 155 pounds. And you could argue that uh, Rustam Kabalov probably was one of the first uh, Russian or Dagestani style fighters to make a big name for himself in UFC. I know that Volk Khan probably is the first Dagestani fighter um, in, in MMA who fought 70 times, uh, which is kind of crazy. But Rustam Kabalov is probably one of the ones that you could say potentially paved the way for a lot of these are uh, the new wave of fighters that we are seeing out of Dagestan and Russia but that's a different conversation let's talk about Rustam Kabalov's career he fought Jorge Masvidal and beat him in a fight which took uh, on the feet for quite a bit he evinced Pichel by a crazy slam and then finished him off with punches after that he lost a couple of times he lost to Adriano Martins who who beat Islam Makashev you know what I mean Adriano Martins might have uh 
be one of those mythical fighters, you know what I mean? He beat Chris Wade, uh, Leandro Silva, beat some really good guys. He did lose to Diego Fajaya, who Diego Fajaya lands a lot of good shots, and he missed weight in that fight. And then he moved up to 170 and fought Sergei Kandosko and win that fight there. But all of those wins, for the most part, were by decision. He did go 10-3 and three in the UFC, had a very successful career. And he actually um, had his last fight on his UFC contract against Sergei Kandosko, and then he signed with Bellator in 2021. And then we just never heard of him. You know, he had a fight booked in, in 2021 and um, it never really happened. I think he pulled out due to illness and we just never seen him again. But he's here. He's back. So I'm picking him to win a fight. I am nervous though, but I do have my reasons though. I do have my reasons. So Jaleel Willis um, in his last two losses has been subbed by Mukman Bakamov, by Guillotine Choke and also by Sada Hamasi. And uh, to be fair though, against Southern Hamasi, he was dropped and then Southern Hamasi kind of swarmed on him, took him down a couple of times and eventually ended up working a rear naked choke and then got on top of Jaleel Willis and then turned it into an arm triangle choke. And then more impressively, I guess so, especially in this kind of matchup, Kyle, Kutch Kyle Crutchmer, sorry, tried to take down Jaleel Willis a lot in that matchup and Jaleel Willis never got taken down by Kyle Crutchmer and won the fight on the feet over three rounds. So... You're really trusting Rustam Kowalov to get the fight to the ground, and I think that is what he's going to be able to do. He is older, he's 36 years old, he's a former lightweight, so he's not really that big for the division, but he is still taking so much time off. I know some of that would have been probably due to injuries and uh, illnesses, but I'm trusting Rustam Kowalov to come back healthy. I'm trusting him to have put on a little bit more weight to fill in for 170 pounds. And I think he is going to be able to get the takedowns and beat Jaleel Willis on the ground. Jaleel Willis is a great striker, but when he has been taken down, although it, um, especially against Savar Hamasi it was actually when he was super rocked, but when he does get taken down, it doesn't really seem like he's got really anything. So I think if Rustam Kabalov can take down Jaleel Willis and control him on top, I think he could be able to get the win here. So that's what I'm picking. It's kind of what I'm banking on in the matchup. So give me Rustam Kabalov to win by decision. The next fight is John Salter taking on Aaron Jeffrey. Aaron Jeffrey is a very interesting case because he fought on Dana White's contender series and then he lost to Kyo Borelho. And now he's found so much success in Bellator. He literally just beat Austin Vanderford by KO, beat Fabio Aguila who was 18 and 2 at the time, won on Cage Fury FC after that. And now if he beats John Salter, you could really argue that Aaron Jeffrey is probably going to get a title shot or a, he's probably one or two fights away from the title shot in Bellator. So it's very interesting for how successful Aaron Jeffrey has been in Bellator to fight losing to Kaya Baraljo. So I'm going to say this, and I don't mean for this to be in a disrespectful way whatsoever, but I'm a huge fan of both of these guys, and it kind of just does make me think, like, man, Kaya Baraljo really is a great fighter because he was able to beat Aaron Jeffrey, and now Aaron Jeffrey's gone on to have his own success in a different promotion. Um, when it comes to the fight, though, I like Aaron Jeffrey to beat John Salter. John Salter's 38 years old. He's on a losing streak now. He did lose to Gagan Musasi, who kind of just beat him up. And then he lost to Johnny Eplin, who then went on to beat uh, Gagan Musasi as well. So I do like um, Aaron Jeffrey in the matchup. He's a minus 325 favorite. John Salter's plus 250, but Aaron Jeffrey's very well-rounded. He's got good boxing. He's got good striking. Good wrestler and grappler himself. Most of his wins are by KO, though. And I do think he is actually going to get a finish as well in this matchup. Um, he KO'd Austin Vanderford in a minute and a half. That's very impressive to me. John Salter got finished by Gaygood Masasi. I know that Johnny Eblin didn't finish John Salter, but Eblin's got a very wrestling heavy style, which probably isn't going to get him a lot of some uh, uh, finishes, sorry, in general. But I'm going to be going with Aaron Jeffrey. I think he's going to get the finish. I think he's going to get the KO. And I think it's going to be a big moment for him. If he beats John Salter... You know, look at who John Salter just lost to, Gagod Musasi and Johnny Eplin. You very much well could see Aaron Jeffrey fight a very top contender or maybe even fight for the title. You never know. So I'm going to be going to Aaron Jeffrey in the matchup, and I'm happy for him. He's had so much success in his career. Now we move on to a scary one. Um, I am very scared uh, in this pick, but I am still going to do it anyway. I'm picking... A almost 41-year-old Katzen Gano to defeat a 30-year-old Leah McCourt. Um, yeah, I'm not confident in this one at all. Katzen Gano is actually the favorite. Minus 400. <laughs> okay, that's interesting. Um, I did not realize the odds were that wide, but I am still picking Katzen Gano anyway. Leah McCourt, honestly, she just hasn't really impressed me um, all too much throughout her Bellator career. She hasn't been fighting the best opponents, and even then... 
she hasn't been looking incredible against these opponents either. I know that some of these decent, some of these opponents might be uh, pretty good, like Diana Silva's a very good veteran of the game, but she did lose to Sinead Kavner. She beat three and three opponent, uh, six and four opponent, but she hasn't looked all that impressive in these wins. And I know Katsangano is almost 41 years old, but I do think that Katsangano should be able to beat. Leia McCourt, who, as I said, um, no disrespect to Leia McCourt, she just hasn't looked all that impressive in her career up to this point. Um, maybe Katsunganu, it could be a very good win for her. I mean, Katsunganu is almost 41 years old, as I said, so it's hard to trust her, but she did just beat Pam Sorensen, who's fighting earlier on on the card. She beat Olivia Parker, who's 4-1, and one, a 6-5 and five opponent, and then before that she was in uh, the UFC, and she had a very up and down um, UFC run. You know, she fought Ronda Rousey for the title and then after that, it was kind of all downhill but she's got really good wins and I know when we talk about good wins, we're talking 10 years ago, so um, take these with a bit of a grain of salt, but she did beat Raquel Pennington, title challenger, Misha Tate champion, Amanda Nunes dominant champion, Megan Anderson she lost to but she ended up fighting for the title, uh, Kit Vieira is probably going to fight for the title, Juliana Pena she lost to was, was going to be, who was a champion, Ronda Rousey former champion obviously at the time, um, man, you really do have to go 10 years back, though, to find the glory days of uh, Katsangano, unfortunately, but I do think she beats Leia McCourt. I'm just not that impressed by Leia McCourt so far. If she does beat Katsangano, though, I think it would be a very good win for her, but Zangano at minus 400, that's uh, that's rough. I'm, I'm a lot more confident in Aaron Jeffrey beating John Salter than I am Katsangano beating Leia McCourt, for example, so I don't really know how I feel about those odds whatsoever, but I still am picking Katsangano by a decision. Now we move on to the main event, and uh, it's a really odd main event in my opinion. You know, Daniel James is 1-0 in Bellator in like the last 10 years. He did make his pro debut in Bellator in 2014, but man, like Daniel James just, just fought recently, got the KO of Tyrell Fortune, which went viral. I will talk about it later, because I've got a lot of things to say about that KO. And uh, Master Logom is only like 2-0 in Bellator, I'm pretty sure. And I uh, had a pretty unsuccessful in the May run, sorry, UFC run, where he did run into um, Sergei Pavlovich. And uh, when you run into Sergei Pavlovich, that happens. <laughs> but uh, no, um, I am picking Marcelo Golm in the matchup. Daniel James has got a lot of power on the feet. He actually got a lot of finishes as well by uh, submission. But I've got Golm by sub. I think Golm is actually going to wear on Daniel James, survive the first two rounds. Maybe even look for some some submissions like um, Tyrell uh, Fortune was able to. But let's talk about that Tyrell Fortune fight with Daniel James. Although it was such an impressive comeback, Daniel James was able to get out of a, a very good rear naked choke attempt. He got taken out a couple of times, landed a couple of good shots in the first round, but he got an amazing uppercut in the second round. And then he finished off the shot with, uh, with ground and pounds, but it was... Uh, it was some pretty nasty ground of pounds and not for good reasons. Almost every single shot that he finished Tyrell Fortune with was to the back of the head. And even some of those elbows were actually 12 to 6 elbows to the back of the head. I'm surprised the ref or the commission never did anything about it. But it was a pretty bad stoppage in that sort of sense. So I am a bit of a Debbie Downer on that one. I'm sorry if I ruined anyone's vibe there. But... Dude, Daniel James has got some wins over some really good guys. Um, we're talking 17 and 8 opponents in ACA, 10 and 3, 19 and 14. I guess this isn't the best record, but very experienced. Brett Martin, he lost to by illegal uh, knees, which is weird because Brett Martin's got like three wins by um, DQ, which is just odd. But um, yeah, I do have Marcelo Golm in the matchup, though. Just to talk about the fight, actually, as it is. I've got Marcelo Golm by wearing down Daniel James up against the cage. He did that a lot against Davion Franklin, although he had not a lot of success in that matchup. He got a massive cut over his eyebrow in the first round, and that just got bigger and bigger and bigger. But he managed to get like some sort, somewhat of a comeback win, like the first last 30 seconds of the match, which was kind of crazy. But we saw Marcelo Golm take down Davion Franklin. He actually got taken down a couple of times himself, which is a bit of a red flag coming into this matchup because Daniel James is so dangerous but at the end of the day Daniel James is 41 years old he's not getting any younger I know it is uh heavyweight so age really is just a number at heavyweight because uh, obviously they're not cutting weight and uh to be brutally honest um it's just is what it is the heavyweights aren't as athletic as some of the lower weight classes they don't move as fast or around as much I mean uh look at the size of me I'd be heavyweight <laughs> But um, yeah, dude, I've talked about me and myself way too much in this video, so I apologize to Angelo and Jacob, but I've got Marcelo Golm in this one here. I think he gets it done by submission later in the fight as well, by like third round um, submission. So 
I think Marcelo Gom gets it done by submission. A lot of people picking James. I understand the hype. I mean, he beat Tyrell Fortune. He's a great fighter himself, a great heavyweight prospect, a great wrestler as well with a great background. But I picked um, Tyrell Fortune to beat Daniel James, and I was very confident in it too. But I've got Marcelo Gom by submission over Daniel James. I think he's going to wear up on Daniel James up against the cage for maybe like the first round, maybe even the second round, and then... Um, he's going to get the takedown and get a submission in the third. So I've got Marcelo Gom to wear on Daniel James, take some of his shots, land some good shots of his own, but for the most part, spend a lot of time up against the cage and trying to get takedowns. It's not going to be that exciting of a fight. Um, if it uh, if it does play out the way that I think it is, if Daniel James wins by KO, obviously it will be exciting, but I do actually have Gom to win. But um, very interesting main event. You know what I mean? Because it isn't the most exciting uh, main event, I guess you could say. I guess maybe even John Salter versus Aaron Jeffrey would have been a more appropriate main event. But overall, this whole card is actually decent. It is your typical Bellator prelim card. But there's actually a lot of fun matchups on here. A lot of good undefeated prospects on here. The main event, as I said, isn't the strongest main event they could probably put on. But they're really gearing up for some huge events in the future. Bellator is going to have that massive Bellator 297. Nemkov versus Ramiro, which is going to be huge. Also, Leon Edwards' brother is fighting Gago Musasi, which is going to be crazy as well. So, I look forward to that. Um, there's a lot of events I'm looking forward to on Bellator, but this is going to be a good one. Um, as I said, um, to be a bit of a downer, the, the main event's not the best main event Bellator could have put on, but it is a good one. So, I'm looking forward to it. Let me know what you think in the comments as well. As always, subscribe to the We Want Picks YouTube channel. We Want Picks also has Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, you name it, and uh, so do I. My own sort of social. Just to plug myself at the very end of the video, and I'll uh, see you uh, in the next uh, next video, actually. I'll see you guys in the next We Want Picks video, which will probably be next week for PFL, so I'll see you then.